On that fateful day, the National Guard helicopters and pilots were in Yakima for training purposes. Normally, they would have been at their home base at Fort Lewis, which is where we took off. Now, the ranking officer on our flight, Colonel Bob Watling, and our pilot, Chuck Knoll, both participated in the 1980 rescue effort. Neither had been on the mountain since those days. And it was interesting to listen to their comments as our flight into the area obviously brought back many memories. That first day, we got several calls saying, uh, uh, hey, there's a report of some noxious gases down here and people passing out. And, you know, as pilots, we didn't want to, didn't really want to hear that. It did turn out to, uh, to be uh, the case, but not knowing what a volcano could do, we were all uh, kind of wondering. We would come in from the west, not, not so much because of the wind flow, but because of the action that was taking place. You see, the north and the south, the forks of the Tudor River, was where the main action was, and everything took place to the north and west of the crater. So it, it kind of mitigated out to the Cowlitz River via the Tudor River, and then south to Calso on the Cowlitz River, and it flowed into the Columbia. Well, all the devastation, or the majority of it, were in those Tudor River valleys, and they all come west out of the mountain. And so that's where we concentrated our activities. I remember a couple of days later, uh, uh, taking uh, Governor Ray in there, you know, and I called the C-130 up high, and uh, I, I called him. I didn't know she was up on the uh, intercom system and hearing what we were talking about, and I called uh, the uh, Skycap aircraft and said, hey, uh, I've got uh, the governor on board, and how about keeping an eye on the mountain, let me know if anything's happening. She comes over the intercom and says, I feel a lot safer, somebody is watching out for me. I got a kind of a kick out of it. But at that time, we didn't know whether it, you know, perhaps could blow again uh, to the extent that it did the first time. And, and if any helicopters had been in there, of course, it would have it just ripped them apart. The major refueling base for the rescue helicopters was the airport at Kelso. And all this area, Charlie and Dave, was so congested with people that you had to keep the runway clear. They would uh, gather around, and uh, every time we landed, there would be 150 to 200 people waiting to see if we had certain people aboard and if we had seen that and what the area was like. Of course, there was great concern at Kelso and in Longview. Concern that the dam at Spirit Lake would collapse and a wall of water would rush down the Tootle River into the Collets and flood the flatlands where the Collets flows into the area. Fortunately, that never happened. Most of the guards' rescue efforts were concentrated in the area west of Mount St. Helens, in the area upstream from Tootle and Castle Rock, where the Tootle River grew from a narrow recreational stream, a favorite of steelhead fishermen, to a mud and silt-gorged waste as material from the mountain flowed down the Tootle. It grew to a width of a mile in some places. Now, people weren't the only living beings affected downstream. Now, these farms in here, the mud came all up around it by water. There was a lot of cattle that were stuck in the mud. And there was people in here that were actually in pretty bad shape also in terms of uh, uh, property uh, destruction and whatnot. And uh, again, that livestock was was uh, physically stuck in the mud. They had jeeps and things that they were trying to pull out of, uh, uh, pull these big uh, uh, cows and cows and horses and things out of the mud. We got had time to come back here later and uh, to look at things like this, you could notice the species of animals that were drinking from uh, water, and the species would be uh, uh, alien, and you wouldn't think that they would uh, have a ha a habitat or habit the area together. And you, you see deer and bear, the elk, and uh, enemies, uh, species, they're drinking right together. That's, that's almost like they reacted like we did. Yeah, I talked to, yeah, exactly. I talked to somebody about it, and he said there, there were some uh, interesting theories that have been uh, propounded as a result of that. And one of these is that when nature suffers such a catastrophic uh, trauma that the, it will let down the natural laws of separation and, uh, to, in order to allow each species to propagate itself again. When we flew into the blast zone, what I saw from the air seemed almost unreal. You've seen it a hundred times before in pictures and on videotape, but until you're there, the impact of what happened doesn't really hit you. 
I think when we finally landed inside the crater of that sleeping giant called St. Helens, even though they'd been there before, our pilot and the colonel experienced something completely different. You're standing right now in the, right in the middle of where it all took place on May the 18th of 1980, and it's, uh, it's a little awe-inspiring to me, although it's, uh, when we were here, we couldn't see anything like this right. because the mountain was still spewing its whatever cubic mileage of uh, deposition and material still out into this area that you see way out to our front. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great experience for me, quite frankly. It's a, I can't help but be impressed with the serenity of everything today. Our pilot today, yeah. Chuck Knowles, said yeah. four years ago, you would have never been able to say Chuck Knowles going to be here in the crater of Mount St. Helens. How do you, do you feel the same way? I told my guys that when we left here, you say, you never catch me landing in the crater. <laughs> <laughs> but here I am, right next to the dome, and with it's an exciting experience. But uh, completely different. You know, when we were here, at, with the mountain was still uh, spewing out everything it had to offer. And uh, we were just amazed at what was going on with the lightning coming out of those black holes and the cloud, of course, the uh, Spirit Lake flooding and yeah. everything else going on, the mud flow, the uh, pyroclastic flows g spewing out the lip of this crater like you wouldn't believe and wondering who was still alive and who, where we would find our next mission. Well, basically, the role of the National Guard during the Mount St. Helens experience was uh, one of support of the law enforcement agencies. The fact that we were so predominantly involved in the rescue operation with our helicopters was uh, simply because we had that kind of equipment. And uh, as you saw on the way up, uh, there were simply no highways right. between I-5 and the crater. There were no railroads and, and no, uh, no way for a ground vehicle to operate. And of course, it made the helicopter in my opinion, indispensable to the success of a rescue operation. Mm -hmm. However, you know, this, uh, the, the eruption of Mount St. Helens was not uh, a real emergency in the sense that we had not had time to prepare for it. The right. mountain started erupting as early as March of 1980, and uh, then the geologists started telling us that it was no longer a question of, of if, it was just a matter of timing. And so we were as prepared for this as uh, we think we could possibly be, given the same sort of set of circumstances. Of course, we had no idea what a live, what problems a live volcano would present to us, particularly in terms of what the ash might do to the turbine engines and the, some of the bearing systems that we have in the helicopters. Uh, but uh, in retrospect, it was uh, we think that uh, we would have done very little different, mm -hmm. actually. And uh, the role of the National Guard outside of the rescue effort uh, was mainly one of support to the local authorities, uh, helping on the roadblock situation. We had a total of 1,600 young men and women of the National Guard participating in the Mount St. Helens experience. Let's talk specifically about some of the things that during the rescue that uh, the helicopters and, and your men did to help take people out of here. Well, the first afternoon, we, we arrived uh, as you know, our helicopters were in Yakima. Right. The, uh, the major helicopter unit that we had on duty at the time was en route to Yakima. And coincidentally enough, on the 17th of May, the day prior to the major operation, Governor Ray had relaxed the red zone uh, restrictions and had authorized the property owners to come back up into the red zone to check on their personal belongings, property, and what have you. Because she did that, she, and knowing that our helicopters were going to be in Yakima, she asked them to be on their, in a response to standby once they got to Yakima in the event that she needed them. Because you see, on the morning of the 18th, she had planned to do the same thing, to allow the property owners to go back up. Well, to, to make a long story short, when the guys got to Yakima, they uh, prepared the helicopters for a rescue role, and it's a good thing they did, because on the morning of the 18th, the mountain erupted. Well, the helicopters were in Yakima. Uh, but it didn't take a metal giant to, to know that the helicopters were required here more so than they were in Yakima. And I happened to talk to our commander in Yakima, Captain Bill Jackson, and said, Bill, where is that ash cl cloud now? And he said, it's right here. It's on top of us. So we uh, mutually agreed that the helicopters would be much better served by coming over here. So he uh, managed to get all but nine of his helicopters out of Yakima. And that's a story of itself. Uh -huh. The ash was there. And the visibility... Actually presenting more of a problem there than, uh, let's say, on the west side of the mountain. Presenting a great For problem, certain. yes. In, yeah. that, in that respect, it was. 
the ash had started to settle on the helicopters, and some of them had as much as a half an inch of ash on them when the, uh, when the guys cranked and the crew started to hover out. In fact, some crews had to have a, a walker go along to wipe off the windshield so the pilot could see. We did manage to get all but nine out of Yakima, and they uh, circumnavigated the cloud in as best they could. Some had to go as far north as Wenatchee, and then come over to uh, Gray Army Airfield, Fort Lewis, although we had told them to divert if they had sufficient fuel mm -hmm. and meet us at the little town of Tootle, 25 miles west of here, to where we had established search and rescue operations initially. Tell me about a typical rescue uh, mission that would be flown by a helicopter pilot and his crew. There are no typical in, in this particular, <laughs> uh, there wasn't even a typical one in this uh, scenario. But. The, only, the only common denominator that you had was every uh, landing was, uh, was a blind landing, literally, uh, regardless of the, the circumstances that the people were in and when we went in to get them. The, uh, it was an interesting approach, any way you wanted to hack it. The, uh, of course, the ground was covered with ash, and we had never operated in ash before. Uh, most of our pilots had Vietnam experience, and they said that they had never seen anything like that, even where they were in Vietnam. So when we would get on about a 20-foot final with a helicopter, the rotor wash would kick up the ash, and it would literally blind you. So you were in a whiteout condition for the last uh, final segment of that approach. So the, the flying conditions were horrendous. They're just uh, terrible. You can't say enough uh, bad things about the flying conditions that day, uh, the, particularly the first day when we came down. Yeah. But the statistics uh, speak for themselves. We brought out 137 folks, four dogs and one boar constrictor on that first afternoon, so it wasn't uh, uh, wasted at all. Good. And you came and yeah. picked up the folks in the area and then brought them where? We either brought them uh, out to the uh, high school field in the town of Tootle or to the Kelso Longview Airport. What was the typical reaction uh, from those folks that you picked up? They were in a state of uh, a shock. Uh, as Chuck indicated on the way down, they, Early on, we had a few that didn't want to come out. They wanted to stay and uh, look after their property, and uh, understandably so. But uh, we were uh, extremely concerned about this mud dam on the western end of Spirit Lake that the geologists thought might not hold, yeah. which would send another wall of water cascading down the north and the south forks of the Tudor River. So that made us create quite a sense of urgency for anything downstream. And uh, so, uh, but after, a few minutes, and when we had explained the situation to them, then they were not reluctant at all to come out and get in the helicopter. We picked up people. Uh, it was just a matter of landing in a field and having people walk to the helicopter. We had a crew that uh, landed on a bridge and hiked in a mile and a half to pick up a person with a broken hip that was in a cabin with, uh, that had been severely damaged. We had a crew that landed in the middle of a mud flow on a log to pick up a person stranded out in the middle of the mud flow. So it was, all in all, it was an interesting afternoon. Colonel, in the final uh, assessment, the final outcome, what did, uh, what did the National Guard accomplish from this experience? Well, it, some have said that uh, Mount St. Helens and the period ensuing the volcano was the National Guard's finest peacetime hour. I have a tendency to agree with that. I think that uh, the result of the Guard's participation in Mount St. Helens was a very positive thing, not only from a recruiting standpoint, but from a sense of accomplishment and gratification for our people. I think we learned also the true character of the, and spirit of the National Guard. If I can climb on a soapbox for just uh, about two seconds Certainly. here, I'd like to do that and tell you that of the 1,600 men and women of the National Guard that participated in the Mount St. Helens episode, I have no personal knowledge of anyone that said uh, I can't make it due to job conflict conflicts or family conflicts or anything of that nature. Great. Thanks, Colonel. You bet. You might recall that when President Carter flew over the Mount St. Helens blast zone four days after the big eruption, he very aptly described the surrounding area as looking like a moonscape. Now, even though Carter had several Marine helicopters airlifted in a transport plane to Portland, along with his own pilots to fly them, the president had to depend on a member of the Washington National Guard to guide them into the blast zone, a pilot who had flown in and out of the zone several times during the past three days, aiding in the rescue operations. That pilot, well, he was the same man who flew us into the crater, Chuck Knoll. Things were happening so quickly, and we had been flying very long hours. It was a situation where we'd get back in here at 10 or 11 o'clock in the evening, 
and uh, our, our uh, mechanics would work around the clock. Next morning, your plane would be ready to go again. Yeah. Well, I got this call from uh, uh, an advisor, the, uh, a former advisor of the National Guard, who then commanded an aviation unit here on Fort Lewis. And uh, uh, he knew that we had been working down there, and he had been tasked to support the presidential uh, visitation of the area. And so uh, he called me. Uh, he and I were personal friends, um, Colonel Don Wilson. And he called me and asked if I'd uh, go down there with him. Well, you have to understand, all my shaving gear and everything was still in Yakima. I mean, we're getting pretty grubby here. Yeah. But, and uh, anyway, I jumped in his uh, Huey, and we went direct down to Portland. And uh, by that time, the, the press, people were starting to arrive. And, but it was late in the evening, and we, the um, Marines have an advanced detachment, of course, and they're the one, fellows that are going to be flying the, the president. Well, the maps, things like this, just were not, uh, they wouldn't suffice in terms of navigation around the mountain. So, so I recommended to them that, you know, we lead the president up there. Well, initially, they, they didn't want to do that. But, uh, so they got in the helicopter. I said, let's go up and take a look. And, and we went up there, and we didn't even get to pass Kelso hardly uh, when they said, hey, uh, I think the, the other idea is best. And so we went on back into Portland, and then the uh, C-5 arrived with the president's helicopters on it. They assembled them. Uh, I briefed the uh, Marine pilots at 11.30 that evening, and then again at 5.30 the next morning. And uh, it was, and then it just all happened. Uh, if you would have had time to, to plan uh, a flight like that, it wouldn't have gone off as well. It, yeah. All of a sudden, we just all cranked, uh, cranked up the helicopters on time. And uh, we took off, and the next thing I knew, I was coming out of Portland International Airport with a flight of eight, well, seven helicopters behind me, eight total. And the president was the number two aircraft. And Who was on your helicopter? Well, I had, uh, I had uh, the Mar one of the Marine advanced people, uh, se several other folks, and I had the fellow that carries that, that uh, briefcase. The black the briefcase, the, yeah. The black, black brief briefcase, and I, <laughs> I don't know what I was in it. But but uh, evidently that was some uh, precious cargo. And, uh -huh. But uh, from there, uh, the weather was down, but uh, it was quite important that we got the president up there so that uh, later the, the federal monies that were gonna be needed for the, the cleanup and, uh, and all of the other uh, things involved. So um, we went on up and we were fortunate enough to get underneath the weather and we got them all the way up just to the vicinity of Spirit Lake and we got into a snowstorm and and uh, snowstorm in May. In May, yeah, the tw what, 22nd of May. Uh -huh. Snowing like crazy right up there. <laughs> and, and that's only about oh, 3,000 feet yeah. there. In the, actually, we're in the Tootle Valley. Mm -hmm. But the president got a good look at it because that whole area that had been beautiful virgin forest prior to this, because I had flown up there several times, was like a moonscape. Yeah. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think he, he described it like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that that, uh, that got a good hit, gave him a good feel for just what kind of dev devastation had taken place. And